This works? Yes. Okay. I'll sign up for a bit. Hi, welcome to uh, Euro Parama and Other Futures, the live podcasting session of Euro Parama. I am Raya Martens. I'm from Are We Europe, uh, the founder of this magazine that you might have seen uh, lying around. And uh, we are a magazine that tries to find out what it means to be European. So this is a perfect place to be. Uh, being invited at European Lab is one of the, the most exciting things of our year, especially because what we love about this is bringing together people who think about Europe differently. Uh, not just Brussels, not the politics, but what is more there about Europe. So what are we going to do here today is definitely an experiment, definitely something completely different. Uh, so what we'll do is do a live podcasting session of the podcast Europarama. Europarama is a podcast about science fiction and the future of Europe. And we will not just do a talk, but we will actually build a science fiction world together. So I'll introduce my first guest. Talking here about his podcast is Giuseppe Porcado. Giuseppe, hi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. How are you? <laughs> good, good. Uh, Giuseppe, you are uh, the author of one of the first real science fiction novels about Europe, and you're also a podcast host. What is it about science fiction that you like so much? Well, science fiction for me, it's like a tool, a tool for exploring and testing things that uh, might be present in our society, but they are not yet uh, visible to, uh, to the rest. So it's sort of a testing ground, a sort of laboratory, but also a sort of a way for uh, looking at our reality uh, in a certain, like in a mirror. So um, that's also why uh, when speaking about Europe, I, I've been always thinking uh, why there are not more cultural products at mainstream level that speaks about Europe. And when I refer to do, those kind of products, I refer to as well movies, I refer to uh, books in, indeed. And, um, and that is a little bit the challenge. I mean, it's a little bit uh, starting as, um, uh, it, it started a little bit almost as a joke, you know, like why, why not writing a science fiction about Europe? And then it became something that, uh, that took shape on a creative form and um, as you point out, uh, there is a book, but there is also this podcast, which is uh, a space of co-creation between uh, different writers from uh, everywhere in, uh, in the continent, uh, where in, in, which, in which we, we try to, to be very open about uh, what can be future scenarios. We want to multiply the idea that uh, we can have different futures, because at the moment we also see that uh, the future is a little bit locked, you know? I have, I have this impression that we, we think about the future as uh, something that is a one-way direction. And through science fiction, I would like to unlock the possibility to make people understand that there are multiple futures and that those multiple futures are determined by the political choices and the life, lifestyle choices of each and everyone. Yes, exactly. Okay, so that is what we're here for. This might, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but this might scare people off a little bit, right? Like science fiction seems this really, really scary, robot-y type of thing that only very nerdy people do. But 
what you're saying is science fiction is a place and a method that you can use in order to think about Europe in a way that might help you forward. So what are the political advantages? What can you really bring out of, of science fiction in a way that you can... Well, <clears throat> the political advantages, uh, I mean, if we need to speak about politics, is uh, first of all the fact that uh, through science fiction, you can immediately approach also people that not necessarily uh, are um, uh, people that might get scared at some point about speaking certain themes. So somehow it's a, it's a vehicle, it's a vehicle to, uh, through storytelling, to, to get into uh, a part of, uh, of the audience that wouldn't be interested necessarily in talking about politics. But on the other hand, it's also an activist tool, because through science fiction you can really imagine uh, revolutionary uh, scenarios without uh, um, the risk or like w w without being in the position where you need to think about all different elements that uh, that are uh, playing in 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 real life so it, that's why i say it's a little bit like a political laboratory because you can test and you can say what if you know for instance what if uh, uh, certain things went differently than, than they went. Like, what if, <clears throat> in the book, in my book, I say, what if uh, after the financial crisis, for example, instead of uh, having, uh, uh, let's say, a rise of nationalism that we've been seeing uh, also, um, I mean, with that, that we're seeing uh, every day in, in today's politics, we would have a reverse situation where, for example, the nation state would have collapsed. You know, so trying to reverse the situations and trying to to play with it and trying to make hypotheses. That's what uh, helps, uh, I would say, also to advance in a political debate. Okay, so uh, using using science fiction, you can think of all these crazy futures. Could you give some more examples of different futures that you've encountered in the novels? Maybe from the, the authors you've interviewed? Yeah, sure. I mean, for... for I mean, Probably you, you're not very familiar with the book because, okay, uh, it, it has been published one year ago. It is not been published in French, so it's all in English. So maybe you have not had the chance to, to get across it. It's called Disco Sour. And as I said before, it, it posits that uh, after the financial crisis, the nation state collapsed. It also posits that um, uh, a civil war broke uh, across the continent. And it's set in this post-war scenario. Uh, where it's kind of uh, similar to our own reality, but slightly different. So, for instance, uh, apps, phone apps are pervasive, even more pervasive than they are nowadays. And it's the story of um, um, some sort of dating app style, like some sort of Tinder, but for politics, that uh, uh, is about to be implemented to basically change the way democracy used to work. So it has a little bit of uh, a Norwegian um, uh, side. Uh, it has also uh, somehow uh, a side about uh, love and relations and uh, how dating apps are changing the way we are uh, relating to, to, um, to sentimental relations and romantic relations. And somehow, I mean, that, that was my idea. I wanted to bring together the, this, this way of communicating through dating apps and the way politics is uh, becoming more and more, more and more Tinderized, you know? And from this idea, it came uh, the, the word of, um, of, of Disco Sour. And Europe plays a big role because basically uh, it is the only political actor that stays in this scenario. Uh, to prevent anarchy on the ground. Good, okay, so this is what we're gonna try to do today, is take one of these scenes and develop a possible future. So what are the things that we might encounter in such a, such a moment? What are the things that we're gonna do today? Yeah, so, so as I say, the, um, the process of uh, inventing a new word as, uh, as some set of rules. There are not so many rules, but uh, the most important thing is that uh, even if it's imaginary, even if you are, let's say, imagining that uh, 
everyone can fly, you still need to put some sort of rule in order to make that, that, that uh, statement somehow coherent. You cannot just drop something in, into a science fiction story and say, oh, all of a sudden, I don't know, it's a story about, about the aliens and all of a sudden there is a Roman gladiator coming in, you know, you, you, need, you need to make it coherent. So this is the first thing. The second thing is that when thinking about word building as a methodology, you want to uh, look at uh, what are the implications for, uh, for societies nowadays. So somehow you want to see uh, the imaginary part, but then you want to see also the, the let's say, the real world implications for that. Um, and this is a little bit what we've been doing with, um, with these other authors, like for example, with uh, Emmy Taranta, which is a, a Finnish uh, writer, we imagined uh, that um, an agency of the European Union would uh, discover a new source of uh, um, free and limitless and, and green energy. And that sounds like, okay, that's just a funny uh, little nice utopia. But then it has a lot of implications when it comes to geopolitics, for instance, you know? And as these, there are many other examples of, uh, uh, of, of words that can change totally just by changing one element of, of our own reality. So for instance, climate change at some point, if you imagine that uh, the cities of the Mediterranean will be floated, then you have a totally different geography for the continent, you know? And then you need to start to think about this geography of the continent. So th that's what I want to say. You change one element on, on our reality, and then you can get into a wider uh, array of, uh, of different uh, futures and imaginations. It can go utopian, it can go dystopian, and, uh, and that's where you test things. Nice. Do you, do you think we're ready to start... Uh going towards the story? Um, I don't know, maybe we want to um, make the listeners listen to uh, some of those words that we have been uh, creating with, uh, yeah. with the other writers. If, uh, if we can get the, uh, the audio clip that we, that we uh, put together. So that you can have when a little bit of a flavor me, of uh, said, what we are discussing about. Do you want to be about. on a podcast where we talk it's about totally potential <laughs> future scenarios for Europe? My first sort of ideas were very dystopian because that's just the way that my imagination seems to be built. It's just England and it's terrible. The, the, the food is really bad, it's dull, it's boring. It's, it's, like, it's like England was in the 1950s. It, be, it kind of makes sense to move everything way, way to the east, you know, to, to move closer to, to Moscow and to Putin and say, all right, you guys, the old Soviet Union, you, all right, you won, we're going, uh, we're going to move everything to Budapest in a way. What happens with, with Brussels? Brussels, it's going to become this kind of non-city with because like half of brussels are offices and then a civil war would have happened chaos and anarchy would have started to rule the continent the nation states would have failed to be capable of holding things on and the only political actor that survived would have been the european union well, i mean we're already past dystopia we're already living in dystopia people are saying oh my god it's coming it's coming now it's already there it's there we know even this you know and now we need to find a way to survive and love in the rooms. Maybe we, we would be using, using water much more as a surface and flying less uh, because, I mean, after damaging the, the ecology as we have already done, perhaps I would like to imagine that this time of adaptation and, and survival, we would actually be these, these these island states that are now, these city island states that are now emerging would be uh, sustainable havens and people wouldn't fly, they would just go on their boats everywhere. I mean, the, the whole okay. so that's a, or the way the, the people... Just to give a little bit of flavor mm, of uh, remember this world building yeah, with other authors. In this audio, maybe yes. it's... Uh... The, audio, the audio was not fantastic, we apologize. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. So, uh, you don't just fall into world building out of nothing. Uh, the first thing that you need is a good understanding of where we already are now. Um, so what we'll do first 
is we go to two very talented uh, political theater makers, uh, two guys that we know from the Netherlands who make theater about the political situation today, and they can tell you everything and just update you very quickly. Um, Dylan Ahern and Jochem Jordan will tell you after these elections, where are we now? What it is that we are actually going to start working with. Hi, everyone. All right. Thank Great. you, uh, Marie. Um, right, so my name is uh, Jochem Jordan, or how you can say in uh, French, Jochem Jardin. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, Dylan Ahern, and we are the Kiesmanner, so to say, or we say in English, the ballot boxers. Um, I'm not sure, how would you translate it in English? I, I think uh, in, in English it was something like uh, Les Garçons de Bulletin de Vote. Um, actually sounds way better in French than in Dutch. It but, does. But what, what we do normally in the Netherlands is that we host political election shows. So we quit our studies because we knew European elections are coming up. They've, they're just over, so we're out, practically out of a job now. But we're very happy to be here in Lyon with you guys. But right. yeah, well, why, why did we organize this, Jochem? Well, the reason that we quit our studies for a while and started organizing in, in big theater venues and theaters, organizing, um, uh, entertaining and interesting uh, shows for young people is, first of all, because in the Netherlands, not only in the Netherlands, also in the rest of Europe, nobody has any idea on the European Union. Uh, only 18% of the Dutch young people went out to vote in 2014. Um, that's one of the reasons why we started the campaign, also together with Are We Europe and a lot of other organizations called Prove Them Wrong, to engage more young people into politics and the European Union, <laughs> and also to make sure that the turnout among young people would increase. And we were actually very happy uh, four days ago because it turned out that we doubled the amount of votes among young people from 18% to 35%, um, which was a great achievement. However, much more happened. I think what we will do in this, in this next seven minutes, very shortly, is to introduce you to a few developments that we have seen in the European elections, um, a, a few notes from our side before we dive into uh, uh, the future of yes. the European Union. Because as Giuseppe just said, um, he mentioned Orwell, and Orwell also said, those who hold the past also hold the future. So let's, um, the European elections uh, are over, you all went to vote, I hope. Are you happy with the elections, uh, with, the, with the outcome of the elections? Raise of hands. Who is happy with the outcome? Yeah, sort of. More or less. Um, on, yeah, so, on a some are not. Some are, are, are you, you're not so happy about the elections? <laughs> no, where, where are you from? <laughs> from France, right, right. Okay, that's <laughs> okay, not so happy. That's maybe an, an interesting side because what we noticed, there are a few developments that we quickly want to mention. First of all is the fact that every country in Europe, that there's not really one, one thing to pin down on these elections. And I saw a couple of uh, raised hands over here, which are from the Netherlands. And we see that actually in the Netherlands, um, uh, nationalism and right-wing nationalist parties did not manage to get as many votes as was expected. While in France, on the other hand, we do see, we, we did see Marie Le Pen obviously uh, uh, winning the elections, which was uh, uh, for some or for many uh, a worrying development. And um, there, there are three main things we would like to quickly mention on uh, the elections four for years, four days ago. The first thing is that it's the first time since the start of the European Parliament that the two main parties, the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats, lost their majority. Um, so this was a, this is this is a, a a big interesting thing. It's the first time that the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats lost their majority in the European Parliament. Next step, we saw on the same time this rise of nationalism and nationalist parties uh, standing up all over Europe. And thirdly, I think it was interesting to see that the Greens, uh, or so to say the Green Wave, um, um, did quite a good job in, in uh, especially Western European countries. So let's get into these three trends then. Because what are the underlying trends that have been driving the outcome of these European elections? Um, first of all, we see that there is an increased interest in climate change, in sustainability. And the most important thing here uh, to remember is that the Greens have always formed a, a, a margin within elections, within parliaments, also in the European Parliament. And now for the first time, they have become a serious party to consider. 
So there's not just an, an, an interest from young people from, from Lyon and from liberal cities uh, across the European Union, but there is a broader interest from left-wing parties to right-wing parties to tackle climate change. Um, but where this always was been in, in the margins since the, year, the 60s and the 70s, now for the first time in the past five years, climate change has been on the top of the agenda and has been on top of everyone's minds and has especially been, um, been in favor of, of, of green parties. So now, now what we see is, is, is a rise of green parties becoming more mainstream. The Green Party became the second largest party in Ireland the second largest party in Germany and in various other EU countries they have gained a lot of seats. But still I should nuance this because a lot of people still think not enough is being done to tackle climate change. Right. Uh, and I, I think to, to, to add on that as well, so it was polled in, in many countries on what is according to voters the most important issue in these European elections and actually in a lot of countries including the Netherlands uh, climate change was the number one issue that uh, voters thought need to be addressed in the European Union but let's not exaggerate because of course there has been some sort of green wave if you would like to say but on the other hand we have seen uh, Marie Le Pen uh, uh, who received the, the most amount of votes in France we have seen uh, uh, Italy that received a lot of uh, nationalist right-wing votes. Uh, the same goes for Germany, in which the AfD increased in the amount of votes. So there is another trend, which is nationalism, right-wing nationalism, which goes together with your skepticism. And I think this is for the coming years an issue that also the European Union needs to think of. Who are the ones that voted for these parties and what is their underlying reason to do so and their motivation to do so? And Obviously, there are a lot of explanations. Some will uh, 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 look at uh, the capitalism uh, in general. Um, but what we can conclude is that the ones voting for Eurosceptic parties um, um, are not the ones that have benefited from the European Union. That's one thing that is for sure. And that's um, um, a trend that we will also need to address, that we will have to see where, does this, where is this going to lead to? What is the reason that in France so many voted, people voted uh, um, uh, for your skeptic parties, while in the Netherlands this was not the case. Uh, and I think that's something that, that might come up later in this discussion as well. And then the final trend is not as big as a trend as the, the green wave or this nationalist wave, but it's what we say is, is a regionalist trend. So we see more and more regions uh, popping up and claiming their self-determination, their right for self-determination. And the first of all is, of course, the Brits. And I'm especially saying the Brits, because it was the English who mostly voted for Brexit and argued for take back control. And the same we see, of course, in the Scottish referendum, also urging for a, a, a regional vote and a regional self-determination. And the same we see happening in Catalonia, in Spain, where Catalonia also proclaimed their own a referendum and announce their own independence. So also there you, we see in various places in the European Union uh, separatist movements, um, the rights of, of self-determination and independence being claimed. It's not maybe as a, a major trend as the other two trends, but it's still something to consider. Right, so now we have shortly discussed three things. First of all, this green wave that seems to have emerged in, in Europe. Second of all, the issue of nationalism and right-wing nationalist parties. And lastly, the parties that seek independence or self-determination. And I think now it is time to think and sit together and see where will the future take us? What path are we taking? We can't have all of it. Uh, um, um, or can we? Or can we? That's, that's the question I think we're very excited to start off, think ahead, philosophize, and see where we can get in the next half an hour. And yeah. also, maybe good to add, last but not least, what do you think the future of Europe holds? So we'd very much like to also invite you, the audience, into this uh, discussion. Yes, and not just in a theoretical way, but in an actual way. So what we will do is this presentation that you can see here. Okay, so what we will do is we will sketch 
three scenarios, three things that might happen to Europe based on the, the little uh, setup that these guys just gave. Uh, we will present them to you shortly, and then you can vote by going to menti.com and using the code 375969. I'm just going to say it a couple of times. 375969 at menti.com. Yeah, now it is. Yeah, so this is a moment you all take your phone out of your pocket. Guys, this is direct democracy. Right? <laughs> this is what you've been longing for all these years. The famous Tinder politics. <laughs> Uh, and, and this is actually also the only time you're allowed to take your phone during a panel discussion. <laughs> nice. Okay, we will uh, start going through the scenarios. After scenario three, you get to vote for which one we are actually going to develop. Okay. First. A climate coup. Dylan, you want to tell? The Gilets Verts have occupied all the gas stations in France, Germany and Poland. Yes. So a major climate coup is about to happen, ladies and gentlemen, because as I said, a lot of people don't think en enough climate action is taking place in Europe. More should be done. And not the Gilets Jaunes, but the Gilets Verts are going to take over. What will we be discussing this scenario or? All right. The next possible vote that you could cast for is the muscles referendum ladies and gentlemen because not just Catalonia not just Ireland but also Zealand the wonderful province of Netherlands in the south declares independence from the Netherlands to nationalize their muscles industry really oh, we even got a like for that that's nice awesome okay the big one <laughs> the assassination Giuseppe. No science fiction story is complete without an assassination. The assassination of Marine Le Pen. That no no comment hard. for that. In Lyon. Jochen Feins is a really hard one to do The assassination of Marine Le Pen in okay. Lyon. Voting time. So will we talk about a climate coup? Will we talk about the muscles referendum? Or will we talk about the assassination? Please all cast your votes. Do we see a live Ooh, results yeah, yeah. I'm, up? Oh, yeah, I'm seeing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah here. Oh, big. Oh. We will give you oh. 20 more seconds. Final votes. I think we're done. I think we're done. Good. That's a very, very clear, very, very clear very results. That's good. That's good. At least wave. most of the audience will like us after this. So that's good. Green nice. wave. Green wave. Yes. OK, so climate coup. Let's say one more time. The Gilets Verts have taken over all the gas stations in France, Germany, and Sweden. Yeah. Maybe, Giuseppe, you want to start off, uh, give us some little yeah, all, science fiction introduction. It all, it all started in a little village in the outskirts of Montpellier, when uh, basically there was a group of uh, climate activists that uh, take, took over uh, a gas station from um, um, a very famous, uh, I mean, very popular uh, oil company. And uh, from there, there has been emulation all over the country. And especially the Gilets Jeunes have been uh, uh, quite outnumbered by the Gilets Verts. And uh, there, are, there have been barricades on the streets between, uh, between the motorways and the, the gas stations. And there is quite a tense situation on the ground, actually, because, you know, um, things that were kind of spurting, sprouting from civil society, all of a sudden started to become kind of violent. Yes. Yeah, because the thing was, the European elections ha have been passing, right? There was a green wave and the, the future looked really promising for the, the green revolution. And people like Greta Thunberg from Sweden, the little girl, was traveling by train, of course, all across Europe to promote this green revolution. But she became disillusioned, right? I mean, uh, three years after, in, in 2022, still nothing really radical happened. So she, she, she became radicalized, didn't she? Yes. <laughs> I, I'm just wondering, because she's from Sweden. Right? Yes. And she moves, oh, she moves to Montpellier. Um, uh, but she never returned, right? <laughs> she, she remained in France. 
I think, uh, uh, first of all, because um, uh, she was not able to get back to her country, but also she was not even let in into her country. Because in Sweden, um, it was actually the case that, that this movement did not get feet on the ground. What, what, what is the reason? What, what is the reason that, that France, yeah. Germany and Poland, that it remained to these to three these, countries? Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe we should ask uh, someone from the audience to, to let us know a little bit what they think. Why Germany and, and, and Poland followed France in this wave mm -hmm. of radical... Who wants to show? Protests. Friends of Poland. <laughs> Anyone would dare to give an answer? Why does France or Germany or where maybe there are other countries who would also be very vulnerable to these protests? Yes, here up front. Um, probably because Poland is one of the largest polluters in the EU and uh, Germany also tends to claim that it's green, but it actually buys a lot of cheap Chinese coal. So both of these countries are very, very vulnerable to so sort of they use carbon, carbon fossil fuels, and they might be very vulnerable to protests. Now it almost sounds like I, I, there was a quiz question. There's a right answer. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, this is about imaginary, so we can come up with a future, right? What is, I think, interesting is that Germany and Poland and France might also be places where actually occupying the gas stations might have the most effects, right? A, a place where... Uh, people have to tr travel large distances where there is actually uh, a lot of car use still. This might be more than just, uh, you know, a statement. This might derail this whole country. Like, what is happening when you, when you uh, occupy the gas stations? Basically, the country paralyzes. There is no uh, movement of goods. There is no movement of people. Okay. So everything gets stuck and frozen in time. So uh, that is perhaps what I would like to elaborate a little bit more, like this, this situation where you have a country that all of a sudden has to completely stop yeah. working. So uh, in a science fiction story, I would like to maybe develop that part, like what, how some people get affected in their daily life about this and maybe get pissed at those uh, Gilles Vert. Gilles Vert. Uh, and then on the other side, uh, there is uh, another extreme fringe of, fringe of society that is uh, going on the streets and basically starting to fight and say, we have enough, we want to get back to, to our normal life because we are, we are stuck. And other people that are going to enjoy this situation and say, ah, oh, finally, I can enjoy, I don't need to take the car, I don't need to take the metro, I don't need to take anything. And, and there is this kind of new community spirit that is going to, to raise, you know, like everyone is helping each other in the community, a little bit like here, you know, like everyone is eating, uh, doing other stuff and, and being very uh, convivial, you know. And, and maybe new relations are, are, are being built on, on the ground. But on the other side, there is like the barricades and there is the fire and there is like helicopters that would like to fly, but they Civil cannot war. fly. The police is stuck as well. I mean, what, 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 what can happen more? What is a police without a police car? That's, that's a very, very bad police. Back on horses, all of them? That's yeah, probably. Yeah. I mean, horses will be back. Yeah, horses will be back. <laughs> and, 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 and this back to the basics is, is something which is being romanticized by the green movement pretty often. Right. You know, small is beautiful and and um, and, and, and and not rely so much on material things, of course, but also maybe also romanticizing um, violence in a way, you know, this is about climate justice. We are fighting for our future. You could see the fury in Greta Thunberg's eyes, which is only starting to, is, is building, we're building up tension. We've been marching for years over the past decades for nothing. And we we're living in the sixth extinction, you know, biodiversity is, 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 is being threatened by, by all these global corporates. And finally, People have been have been really saying no, and people have been really standing up. And sometimes, sometimes they say violence is needed for a higher purpose. Yeah, but tell me a little bit more this kind of violence. What exactly will will mean? I mean, well, let me tell you. Going to, people are going to die. People are going to be hurt. Is it just 
a demonstration of force? Uh, is it a farce or is it a real, 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 real nasty thing that no, is going it, on? It, as you said, it all started in Montpellier with this one gas station. And this really sparked, literally, uh, the, the blow up of this gas station really sparked and symbolized an event, uh, symbolized a, a, a broader trend. Whereas um, also a, a climate march also sometimes symbolizes to organize climate marches in different cities, just like the climate strike. So what happened, there was one uh, bombing of a gas station in Montpellier and another one followed in the heart of Germany in Berlin. And then it was the time of Krakow, then in Poland. It, yes. 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 <laughs> and then, but then, you know, then, then that was really the, just the tip of the iceberg. Because once there were three tanks, three petrol stations, um, Europe got crazy. Because also, let, let's remind ourselves, a lot of moderates also stood up. And also more uh, right-wing extremism became a counterforce and became organizing themselves in paramilitary groups. But, but so, if, if I may interrupt you, if you see this a little bit like a guerrilla tactic, so it shouldn't be all at the same time blocking all gas stations. Right. If it's a guerrilla tactic, you have uh, that gas station is blowing in Montpellier, the other one is blowing randomly at some point in another place, in another country, and then there is uh, this kind of tension and people will stop to use the car because they are afraid to go to the gas station. I mean, if I would have to organize, if I would be the mastermind organizing this, I wouldn't block everything together. I will create this sense of tension like, do I go to fill my, fill my tank or do, I, or, or do I stay home and take my bike, you know? I mean, what is safer? Well, I think what, what will be in particular interesting to, to see is that obviously these three countries, they're very much interconnected with other European countries as well. So especially the ones living on the border will be the ones that take the most risks and will be the ones that, that drive to the Netherlands to find a safe haven, um, uh, not just for their tax evasion, but also for their <laughs> gas uh, evasion. <laughs> um, and to, to get cross-border and to build new connections. They find their friends of gas stations that do actually work and that seem to be still a safe place for, for car drivers to their, seek their safety and to be able to continue their movements in the countries that are still safe within the European Union. So you are almost suggesting that uh, car drivers will become, will have a so sort of transnational identity, that they will emerge as a new nation, you know, like the, the, the nation of the car drivers, and then they will start to have their own uh, uh, culture and, and bonding. And, right. and, they they, they might even start speaking their own language, because obviously, <laughs> yeah, on, yeah, <laughs> for, for the ones that uh, they're too scared that their, their, their regular language will be picked up by, by the, the movement of, uh, uh, of, the, of the Greens. And they start to develop a new language in, they, in which car drivers can communicate, and in which like they can... code language. The car language, yeah, <laughs> all all, all made language. all made with car parts, and and each car part means yeah, something what, else, you know. Where, where's the safe parking? Where do we still find our yeah. safe spots? Where we can we come together and discuss uh, in, in private? Yeah. Yeah. So the the car drivers go underground, yeah. They go underground with their own code and, language. And, and so, according to this logic, what is going to go underground is also the circulation of the fuel. So basically, there is going to be all sorts of smuggling of gasoline across across places in little uh, in, in, in little bottles and stuff like that. So basically, uh, the, the the fuel, the, the gasoline, is going to become some sort of very uh, illegal kind of good, you know, like some sort of uh, new drug, because these people, the, the car nation, is addicted. To, to, to driving and is addicted to this uh, gasoline. So uh, I, I don't know if you, if you know the, the, the book uh, Dune, Dune uh, or the movie. It's a very famous uh, science fiction uh, book where there is this, uh, this intergalactic empire and it's all based on the trade of the spice. The spice is some sort of drug that, that makes you uh, 
uh, telepathic and and have superpowers and stuff like that and and also very high um and and somehow i i can see this kind of uh, uh, uh relation you know that the, the gasoline becomes like the spice in in um, in dunes and and we spark a new kind of uh, wars and new kind of very um, very weird scenarios, you know? What I like about this drug analogy is that if we look at car drivers today, you might already see quite a, a, a disparity between car drivers and urban citizens who might use public transport a lot more. So this will obviously be so much more torn apart and maybe even made worse by this kind of addiction to fuel so maybe these these disparities between different groups might actually grow and I, grow and I, grow I, I think it's yeah at some point they will start to um either to sniff or or, or to to inject uh, little doses of, uh, of 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 gasoline because i think that at some point it becomes like some sort of religion or or like well, ayahuasca or something like that yeah i think the interesting thing that at first they will try to organize publicly and start their own political party and see how they can organize. But at some point, they will just be forbidden, right? And they, it, it won't be even legal anymore to, to formalize their, the, the unity of car drivers. Right. And to, especially with the problem of, of oil injection, of course, and gas injection. Um, uh, Are we... Um... Maria. Sorry. <laughs> Fini finish your sentence. No, no, so I think it's, it's well, at first it seems um, maybe fine and then it, it, it will be legalized. Um, I think afterwards it, it, it becomes a serious, a serious crime and more and more uh, of those car oil supporters will be put into a little, little box that you don't want to be in. Um, in into a side which is, which is looked, looked against to. I just wanted to make sure that uh, we don't get ahead of ourselves and just get into one corner of this story because that's what can happen, obviously. So I put up one thing that you could use or you can just come up to us whenever you think like, hey, you're missing like a really big part that could happen in this story. You could uh, add it to, uh, to the questions of the audience and we will try and see if we can reel it back into our, into our story. So we'll leave this up. I'm just like giving this opportunity. So a little recap, like where... Uh, Needs to be back in the little recap. Where are we now? We are now in a nation that. Can I propose a name for this story? Yes. Car junkies. Car junkies. I like. I like, this. I like car junkies. <laughs> Have you seen the the movie Waterworld? Sure. The, you know where when the. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let me explain it then. Um, have, have you? Who has seen the movie Waterworld? I no, it's, it's, you know, it's, the whole world Wanga. is covered by, by water and there's these motor junkies. It, it, it sort of, it really feels like it's something like this, but then we're not underwater yet. But there's a, a really sort of paramilitary group who's really addicted to fuel and smoking, by the way. Um, and, but then, wh who are the heroes then, uh, Giuseppe? There are no heroes. There's just these this two factions that, you know, those, uh, those, uh, uh, climate warriors that at the beginning looked so cool and nice and everything, then they also become like uh, uh, some sort of reverse medal of, of the others. So it's a little bit of a Mad Max situation. Yeah. You know, it's, it's somehow, even if uh, climate somehow it's saved, the society <laughs> went completely nuts and it's basically like some sort of uh, dystopian uh, scenario from the point of view of society. But we saved the planet. So, I mean, from, from a grand perspective, maybe this is, this is okay, you know? Yeah, I, I think it's a, because questions are popping in, and it's a good question also with the Gilets Jaunes, of course, that there's often the question of who, who's in charge. Um, that might be the case here as well. How, how, do, how do these climate warriors organize these are themselves? Five questions into one. The, I, will, I will read them out quickly. Is Greta Thunberg the leader of the Gilets Verts? Is she exiled? Is she living in an embassy? Does she hug trees 24 seven and only eat vegetables? Uh, describe our role in this dystopia. I think this is, uh, we're right. We, we eating, went all the is, way into Since these, when uh, is eating vegetables only so utopian? <laughs> <laughs> Can I That's just a vegetarian, ask a vegetarian? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I, I do think, I, we, I propose I, and I agree that Greta Thunberg 
She is not only already the face of a new generation of climate activists, she could become definitely the leader of the Gilets Verts. I mean, she has the charisma. She is uh, traveling across Europe, inspiring young she's people. Young she's young still. She's passionate. And she's angry. And she is angry. And, and but the problem she's is... She's also highly logical. She's highly logical. She's Where, like, can, can violence come out of... A logic mind like hers. I that's, think, that's I think most terrorists are actually really educated and smart people. So I think, <laughs> no, I mean, serious. We're they, going they, to start to drive a slippery slope here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to romanticize eco-terrorism here, ladies and gentlemen. This is fantasy. But I, I am dead serious in the fact that um, people have been romanticizing violence in, in, the, in the past. And uh, this could be this form of eco-terrorism in the name of climate justice as a form of some sort of biodiversity liberation could very well take place, especially people like Greta Thunberg and who, who will start to follow her through social media, through Instagram, Snapchat, uh, WhatsApp groups as some sort of new... Uh, ways of organizing themselves really rapidly all across Europe with all these climate strikers, you know, these young idealists who are being, who are being uh, enchanted basically by the speeches of Greta Thunberg. Um, I agree. I also want to add something because we say that uh, in the other faction of society, the, the car junkies, uh, the, f the fuel becomes like almost a religion and everything. And I like a little bit to have this um, sort of s spiritual um, theme running a little bit across the, the, um, the story because obviously uh, s spirituality, sometimes we forget about it, but it's a big driver of, uh, of, 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 of mankind. And I think that Greta will, will basically become a religious leader in all this you know she she starts to be an activist and a radicalized person but then, uh, and then at some point she switches you know there are there are images of greta everywhere and uh, she's like worshipped people light candles to greta and at some point we don't even know if greta is an hologram or is a real person yeah. and especially because it could very well be that she is being um being threatened and forced to live underground um, but that will only sort of magnify the, the aura and the spiritual uh, embodiment of, of this persona. And, like, maybe, and if this continues, then the question is even, does she even exist indeed? Is exactly. She, is she She's an hologram. She's an hologram. She has been underground for so long. Is she still alive? Is she there? And people start... <laughs> Believing in her and just follow and continue and start reading on her Maybe there might phrases. Be there will be, be there like will a be book like, situation. You know, you know the Holy Mary, like, a... like the Holy Mary. You have appearances of the yeah. Holy Mary in uh, Lourdes or, or, or Fatima. You know, there will be a place where, oh my God, Greta, Greta Thunberg appeared there. And then, you know, like a statue of Greta Thunberg cried, you know, and there would be like and miracles. Then, but then, at the same time, just like the Reformation, the, the car, car junkies, the fuel junkies are bombing these, these images and these portrayals of her as a sort of a reformation uh, counter attack, I think, to these. You know, so it's also a battle of, 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 of imagery. I see there's one more question, but our uh, presentation is not popping up. Does anyone want to, like whoever that question was from, want to say it? In real life? Who has another That's, question? Just, there's, there's two more, yeah, I cannot, can you see it? So, how do oil countries respond to this, like Saudi Arabia, how do they yeah. respond to the nice. gasoline that, that less good, gasoline good, good. being sold? I like it. Oh, they just, they just continue to sell oil to the rest of the world. They say, Europe gone mad, we don't care. That's not an, <laughs> an interesting market for us. We just continue to make business with the Americans and with the yeah. Chinese. But, yeah, we but, are a lost continent, aren't we? I mean, we, uh, we're talking about emerging, emerging countries, emerging continents like South America, like uh, Brazil, of course, China, uh, Russia, to some extent. They'll be probably the big, still the big um, users of fuel. And but what we've I, seen with the climate marches that actually a lot of the uh, students 
across the world join these. So it's not like this movement does not have a hold on other places. It's not just a European thing. I was wondering, do we only stick still to, to Poland and Germany and France? Because yeah. I think once once Greta becomes becomes the holy uh, 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 holy spirit of the new generation, then it might be it might be the case that especially in these countries in which oil is dominant, like Saudi Arabia, like Iran, for instance, that there are new new movements coming up, even more underground. That that's that there's a little spark in in this movement. What do you think? Is it is it, is it just European, Dylan? Yeah, especially well, especially in countries where there's a sort of an underground culture like Iran, by a, a, a young generation who is feeling maybe suppressed or repressed already, that these uh, these ideas and spiritual movements could reinforce and set in motion a new a new movement. And maybe, of, it maybe it might be even the case in in the, the Islamic revolution in in Iran will change into a. A green revolution, right? The green ray and the green wave will finally be re-implemented. Yeah, so not Saddam Hussein uh, as I Islam terrorist, but, but Greta Thunberg as eco terrorist. And I saw another question here. So yeah. now we're assuming, I think, that everybody wants to jump in on the green wave. What about those people who don't want to be part of this wave? How do you make them adhere to the rules? How do you make them implement the change that you want to see? So what about the silent majority, sort of? Yeah. Right. Good question. Who wants to what jump in? What about the silent majority? What will they? They stay silent. <laughs> they, the silent majority stay silent. So they don't speak. They continue their life. Some of them, they, they get... If you remember at the beginning, we say at the beginning that uh, the fact that there are no cars anymore uh, foster a new way of life that is like more community style and so on. So they kind of uh, stay a little bit on the shadow. Uh, some of them, they join the, the counter-revolution. So some of them are car junkies, you know. The ones, uh, uh, the ones maybe they victimized. don't want to be too upfront, but they, they still buy the fuel in the, in the black market because you say there's going to be a black market, so they make money, they just go along with the thing, they, they, they buy the fuel, they, uh, they do their stuff uh, if they really cannot pass uh, not to use the cars, and, um, and they kind of adapt. Yeah. Is, is civil war unavoidable, Giuseppe? You're an expert on civil war. Yeah, that's you mean in this scenario? No, because we based all our story on violence, so it's based on on radicalization. In in real life, it's a different story. Okay, uh, Maria, what do you think? Is civil war unavoidable in this scenario? I I um no, I think it depends on how well uh, the the Gilets Verts are organized, but. Um, Civil war, I think, only happens when everyone in the situation gets victimized, when there's with so many different people like, under very stressful situations. And I'm, I don't think I'm seeing a situation in where everyone feels threatened and is ready to take up arms just to protect themselves. I, the, the last thing that I would add is I think if indeed the Green Movement manages to organize themselves properly and manages to suppress uh, and really oppress the, the gas warriors, in a sense, maybe with a lot of violence, then if they, if they manage to build a new community and really a new order of, of maybe even a, a green dictatorship, then, um, then, then maybe in that sense we can, we can suppress the, the, the gas warriors that, that want to try to remain underground. Greta will probably say, you are either with us or <laughs> against us. Greta will right? go mad. She will go mad. And I mean, this could be really serious. Are you either for nature, for the living of our planet, or are you for the destruction of our biodiversity, of our blue planet? And you know, I think in his final words and in his final documentary, David Attenborough will say, the planet, our planet is in our hands. Join. Greta Thunberg and the Gilets Verts. I think that will be his last words on his deathbed. I don't know how old he is now, but it will be soon. <laughs> I think that's a very good last word for this, uh, this story too. Let's end there. That's okay. really beautiful. Um, yeah. So we ended up in a crazy situation that obviously 
you don't just walk away from that instantly. So what you do in world building is you take a minute to debrief. And let's talk about this. Yeah, maybe just a few words uh, from, from your side. I would like to hear uh, what, 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 how do you feel about imagining such kind of uh, crazy stories on, on things that might happen or might not happen in, um, in reality? Is that something that, uh, I mean, how, how did you felt about that? I mean, maybe we, can, we were just can, can I ask saying a bunch of bullshits and that, that's it. You, you've, yeah, you've been writing along. What, what did you guys think of this exercise? Uh, I didn't write anything about the story because it was completely uh, <laughs> crazy, I think. But uh, yes, I think it's possible that uh, the Gilles can develop themselves as a violent group. And I don't think that it's uh, a dystopian. I think it's maybe a prediction, a real prediction. I think. Okay, thank you. Any others who would like to say something? Or I'll force you to say something, <laughs> as undemocratic as I am. Maybe here in the back, uh, Madame and Monsieur, you've been listening, no, eating. I think you've been watching, listening. What did you think? Um, you started with the Gilles Vert, so as a group, they bombed the gas station, and you really pointed out that it was a leaderless situation, and then you went to a big part about Greta Thunberg, and I think it's not the way it should be taught this story. It's not a group story, I mean, it's not a leader story, it's a group story. It's a band of people doing stuff uh, against uh, sort of a self-proclaimed eco-terrorist, a uh, far left uh, wing guy. And if nothing is being done before 2030, 2030 is being seen as a sort of really important year um, to really have transformed our economy, transformed our society to save our planet. I could really well envision a new generation, really, in the generation of Greta Thunbergs with the climate strikes all over the continent have showed it, that there is a sort of a new activism emerging, which could become violent. Yeah. And, and then what, to what extent, and I don't know, but... We, we even see it, not, not even violence, but also just, um, how do you say, civil disobedience, no? Yeah. Uh, civil disobedience in the sense that the climate strikes are a good example of that. Extinction, rebellion. It's, that it, it's not, not immediately into violence, but the first step, obviously, is that we see nowadays already is the fact that we, yeah, you don't go to school anymore, you just go on strike. We don't listen to the ones that um, uh, basically neglect its um, uh, uh, climate action. And... I, th I think that's an interesting first step to see that somehow, especially the young generation, is willing to to be a little disobedient in order to reach a greater goal. And how far that reaches on the end also depends on the action that will be taken. Um, but I think, well, as long as it stays minor, it's a, yeah. it's a positive trend, surely. <laughs> yeah, but going through this exercise for me was uh, was definitely something that could also show you know, some, some kind of more disastrous effects of whatever we're going through right now. I think it, that for me was the, the best part of doing this, is that you, when you tell these stories and talk about whatever that could mean, you actually start to envision it, like what would that future actually look like? I think I'm, that's what I'm taking away from this. So um, what we'll also do with this is that we're gonna write an actual narrative story out of it, um, and we might even, we're going to publish it as a story in our magazine, our year, but we might even uh, make a graphic novel out of this, which is obviously the best, the best place to be imaginative. Um, so this is not where it ends. This is where it starts. We are starting to build worlds and to think about the future. And hopefully what we hope for you is that you can take them with you to use when you envision these futures for Europe. And obviously, you can start to follow Europa Rama uh, on your podcast uh, app. And um, every, like week, every week, we have a new uh, conversation and a new world building with uh, another writer. Yes, definitely worth a, worth a listen. Giuseppe, thank you so much. Jochen, Dylan, thanks for the, for the input. And uh, thank you all for being here. Have a good day.
Thank you very much. Euh, je vous invite maintenant tous, euh, si vous le souhaitez, à participer au Mediapart Live euh, sur euh, les résultats des élections européennes. Just now, a Mediapart Live about Europe. No. Donc, il y a une, un Mediapart Live de, qui démarre euh, sous la nef à H7 et également le parapodcast à Hôtel 71. Donc, je vous invite à, à rejoindre ces programmes si vous le souhaitez. Merci. There is a house built out.